Oh, man. <laughs> so, uh, my last video talking about uh, pool braids being a market manipulation tool or an excuse for market manipulation was not a very popular video with certain people. Uh, how does Rattle Pokemon put it? Wiener babies. Uh, it is real easy to upset people who don't believe market manipulation or don't believe buyouts are market manipulation. And I'm just going to say let's respectfully agree to disagree. With that being said, today I am going to be talking about buyouts. And this is directly in response to uh, Danny Phantom's video where he's talking about certain illustration rares being bought out. And I'm going to go over a couple of those illustration rares that are kind of being pumped right now. Especially considering that a lot of people were like talking about how cheap Scarlet and Violet was and how low a lot of the cards were and how everybody was focused on Sword and Shield. And I'm going to kind of talk about why certain cards from Scarlet and Violet are being targeted. So let's go ahead and take a look at one of the first cards that Danny mentioned. This is Greninja EX. And over here on TCG Player, you can see Greninja EX. Start off with a pretty good high. I think this is pre-order pricing though at like 150. Drop down to about 118. Climb back up to 170. Slowly drop down back to 130. And has just been on the climb ever since. Ever since the June 8th, the 10th, this card has just been on a rapid climb. So in about 12 to 15 days, this card has seen a 100% increase from about 130 to about 220. And we see that the lowest tier available on TCG players around 230, unless you include the Japanese ones, which there's going to be a video later this week titled Do Not Buy Foreign Cards from TCG Player that's Japanese, Korean. And I'll talk about why these prices are really bad um, in, uh, in a future video. But we're going to focus specifically on English listings, listings here that will give you an English copy from Twilight Masquerade. And you see here they're $230 a piece. And it seems like it's going to hold pretty strong. While there's only two pages of listing for Greninja, it seems like Greninja is probably going to hold strong at a pretty high price point going forward. I don't think Greninja is going to necessarily hold that 230 for a long time. Uh, just personal prediction, I think it is going to climb back down. But I don't ever think Greninja is ever going to be a sub $100 card. And I think Greninja is going to hold a pretty strong price point going forward. But just like uh, Danny showed in his videos with something like uh, uh, Giratina Alt Art, do not FOMO. Some of these really, really high price tags can curve in the opposite direction. These curves don't continue continuously go up. That's why Scarlet and Violet cards are being targeted and why a lot of the Sword and Shield cards are currently sitting. These trends that show upwards trend don't always stay in the upwards direction. And 99% of the time, they will trend downwards. That brings us to Chansey. Chansey is another Twilight Masquerade card that has seen a great climb recently. It was around a $10 card and then all of a sudden it spoke, uh, spiked up about 100% as well to about a $20 card. And we see here currently on the market at the time of recording, the lowest copy is $19.69. But if you wanted to find your first trustworthy seller, you're spending about $20 after taxes. So trends up pretty quickly. Uh, very, very beautiful card, by the way. Uh, very underappreciated. But I want you to notice a common trend so far. What do these two cards share in common? I'll get to that point later, but I want you to start thinking about all these cards when you think about what they have in common. And no, I'm not talking about their, they both can be classified as illustration rares. Then we move over to Raging Bolt EX. Raging Bolt is where I wanted to kind of show that the trend can reverse. Now... Once again, Raging Bolt dropped down to like a $50 card, spiked up to 100, and has slowly trickled down in the past couple weeks, back down to about 80. Raging Bolt is playable, right? So when we think about Raging Bolt, we're thinking about cards that are playable. And Raging Bolt is not a very popular card in terms of design, although I think a lot of people are coming around to it. I'm one of those people. But... A lot of people don't like these uh, paradox forms of Pokemon. They don't like these ancient forms and these future forms of the legendaries. And I can see why uh, a lot of people are like, look how they massacred my boy when they see Raikou looking like a freaking ancient dinosaur that doesn't even fit the theme of Raikou. Because when you think of Raikou, you think of a fast uh, electric Pokemon. And 
in here, I don't get the va uh, the vibe of fast with any of the long neck dinosaurs. You get what I'm saying? And I could understand why people don't like this guy or like this card. So it's, it was kind of interesting to see this card hype up, but it also got in tandem with that hype of playability. A lot of people found this card to be very playable. So that in combination with the fact that it is one of the better SIRs in terms of artwork in the set, it helped to spike up. But the spike barely held on for like a few days and it already started trickling down. And in about a month's time, it dropped down another $20. And it looks like it's holding consistent at around that $80 range. We see a lot of sellers here who have multiple copies, four copies here from Mystic, four copies here from Cardhaven. Now, give or take, you can make the prediction if those are uh, legitimate copies from these shops or if they participated in buyouts that helped the spike go up in the first place. Um, and we'll talk about at the end of the video, like what are the benefits of buyouts to people who participate in them? Like people who do buyouts, what are the benefits? But Raging Bolt is just an example of how these trends don't always stay up high, but they still hold higher than where they were initially before the hype happened. Because if you even if you think about the lowest price point before it spiked up to 90, it was at $60. It's still a, at an $80 price range right now. So moving on to Gaslight, this is another card that kind of trends downwards after a big spike. Now Gaslight at one point, it didn't show on the market data because that was a very, very temporary thing. But Gaslight at one point was like an $80 card. It spiked up like very, very high at one point, but it was very, very temporary. And I think the highest point where you could say it legitimately spiked and held for a while was at around the $30 price point. And right now it's still holding at a $28 price tag. Now ignore all the Japanese ones once again. And you got a you got a couple here that are around $26. Um, now tw uh, 2,300 sales with 0% feedback. I would always recommend avoid those sellers. I'll move my head so you guys can see that. And then you got some lower end sellers, but like Legends GR, if you're not looking for a gradable copy, he's got a light plate for $25, which is a great deal. And you're going to have sellers just slowly trickle up going over to that like $29 price tag. And I got to say, Gasly is holding pretty strong. Gasly has been above $20 for about a month now. And it has seen a bump and a uh, glide down. But it's far cry from that low point of $16.44. So when we move over to another set, right, we're going to talk about Paradox Rift. And why Paradox Rift seen a lot of the spike that uh that ended up happening. Cause you see here, Groudon was a $20 card. And at one point it was under $20. I think it was like $15, $18. And you see here over time, it has just climbed up consistently. And then it hit a high point of 63. And now it's back down to about a $50 price tag, with the lowest be on the available on the market being a moderately played at 40 from a seller who's only got 36 feedback. But if we wanted to get our first near mint copy, and this is a seller with zero feedback, $46. Then if you go to page two, you quickly bump up to that $50 price tag, if, especially if you wanna use a reputable seller, not somebody who will ship a $50 card in a plain white envelope, but somebody who will actually ship with tracking and give you proper uh, care for your card. Now you see here a Japanese copy at $52 above the English market. And uh, well, once again, we'll get to that video. Now you see direct by TTG players advertising a $73 copy. That means one of the lowest prices from direct is gonna be at $73, which does influence that list of medium price when you have prices that high listed. But never pay attention to medium price, always pay attention to market price. And market price says that a lot of these copies would be around $50. Groudon has held on very strongly and has just climbed over time. I do think Groudon has one of the best artworks from Paradox Rift, so it makes a lot of sense that Groudon has seen that success. Another one that has seen a lot of uh, success from Paradox Rift is Steelix. Steelix was like a $20 card, um, and then went down to hold around 10 for a long time, 10 to 13, and then it just spiked back up to that $20 price tag for who knows why. And it's held consistent at about that $25, $24 range. If we look over here for our lowest near mint copies from non-reputable sellers, about $20, $22. But if you start going with your uh, orange star sellers, it's going to be about $24, $23 per copy, 
which is still holding pretty consistent. It's not dropped drastically from that high point of a $26 price tag, but it is slightly down. Steelix is another great artwork, and I think this is probably going to be one of your most popular Pokemon from the set. Steelix is a, an evolution of a Gen 1 Pokemon, Onyx, who was featured heavily in the show. And uh, he's a very popular Pokemon. I think one of the first Steel types we've ever seen in terms of like new Steel types, because I know they uh, posthumously made Magnemite a Steel type as well, but... Steelix was like the first deal type that everybody had encountered who played Pokemon as a kid or collected Pokemon as a kid. Evoltal's another one who's seen a spike. This one actually surprised me. I didn't think Bacon Bird had a lot of hype, but you got to combine that artwork with the, uh, the fact that it is a legendary Pokemon and anybody who played XY bought a game either featuring this or Xerneas on it. And I think this was the more popular of the two. I think Eveltal had a little bit more popularity than Xerneas, although I was a Xerneas bro myself. I bought uh, Pokemon X. If we look here, Lois Near Mint copy, about, oh, all these Japanese copies need to go, about $16 if you add in the shipping from non-reputable sellers, somebody with 21 feedback, but 95%. Uh, I would definitely avoid that seller. If I was buying my first copy, I would consider it two bros in a box up here at $17.50 uh, roughly for a copy. Then you can go with old trusty Troll and Toad for $17.99. The problem with going with Troll and Toad, though, is uh, there is a joke when we talk about Troll and Toad near mint in the hobby. And uh, you would probably have to understand that joke by shopping at Troll and Toad yourself. But Troll and Toad does not know what near mint means. Uh, but... $17, $18 dollars is going to be the lowest you'll spend on a copy from a reputable seller. So that shows that this card is going to keep uh, trending upwards at the moment. Now, give or take, you do have the lower end Japanese copies if you wanted to buy. But be mindful that the $6, $7 you'll spend on Japanese copy, probably a little bit over the price where you can find it elsewhere. Now, I wanted to talk about something with Galissapod. Galissapod is an SIR that is holding at about a $13 price tag. So that shows that three IRs are more desirable than an SIR. Even though this SIR has trickled up a little bit from its uh, low of 1167, it's still not trickling up like you would think an SIR would. And I want you to think, why is Glissopod not trending upwards, but the other cards are? Why would Glissopod not trend upwards It's an SIR but we're seeing Eveltal and Groudon trend up. Keep that in mind while we talk about some cards from 151, such as uh, Charmander. Charmander's just been holding strong. There was a low point where Charmander was at like $21. And I think this was, uh, I want to say this was around a time when a lot of 151 booster bundles found their ways to Walmart and Target shelves. Like a lot of people were finding them in Walmarts and Targets. So it was like just a temporary drop and then it picked right back up and it has climbed up a little bit recently. Now, I want to be mindful that most of the time this card has been sitting over $25, but right now the market price is showing it at about $32. And I can see this card being Charmander climbing up over time. I can see it going higher and higher going forward. And the reason why I can see this with Charmander, not only is it probably the most popular Gen 1 uh, starter, out of the three but it's also from a set that is becoming increasingly harder to find at a good price and it's going to be less of it less of it and less of it ripped and unless somebody has a large stack of 151 somewhere that they're just going to rip in massive bulk to provide these cards somewhere we're going to see this charmander less and less on the market over time and increasing in price more and more and i think we'll see that with a lot of 151 cards honestly I think as 151 slowly really fades out of the market, we're going to see it increase drastically, especially once the Japanese version of 151 uh, starts to trickle down and less becomes available as well. We're going to see a huge increase. But I want to compare Charmander to something that was very popular when the set released, Erica's Invitation, which has just slowly trickled down. Now, it did have a slight bump around early June back up to 20 Remember, though, this card on release was like a $40, $50 card. And now we're seeing a market price of $18.98 with a lot of near mint copies sitting at the $18 range. A lot of sellers who I would never buy from personally, but if you go to the next page, 
you can easily find $19 copies for um, from reputable sellers, which um, MinMax is a pretty reputable shop. Uh, this is a brick and mortar store, so they're probably shops you can trust compared to somebody with zero feedback, somebody with only 62 sales. So there are some cheaper copies if you wanna take the risk, but you're still sitting at about 18 to $19 per copy, even from reputable sellers. Now, moving on to Obsidian Flames. Obsidian Flames has got a couple of cards that have trickled up. Uh, Ninetales is pretty much doubled in price. Ninetales is a very popular Pokemon done by a very, very popular artist, Sai Nanahara. Sai Nanahara is probably one of my favorite artists in terms of what they do with their artwork. They have a very complex style that's not um, like Shinji Kanda's where it's super busy. It's very simplistic, but very complex. All the colors that they use all the amazing artwork that they attribute into it, such as the Hisuian Zerork V-Star from Crown Zenith, such as the Ninetales, such as I think it's the Gotharita IR. Very complex artworks, but very simple at the same time. Like there's a lot of detail to them, but they're not overly busy where you can really appreciate the Pokemon. I think that really helps this Ninetales trend upward. Ninetales is also a very popular Gen 1 Pokemon. Compare that to something like Reverum, where Reverum is just kind of held steady around that $3 range. Now, it did have some low points where it went down to like $2, but it's been between $2 and $3. And I don't think it's ever really going to break that $5 ceiling in the near future. And I think the main reason for this is Reverum is just not a popular Pokemon. It's not done by a very well-known artist, and it's just not an appealing artwork compared to something like Ninetales. So that's the reason why a lot of the SIRs and Obsidian Flames are trending downwards or not trending upwards. But you have something like Ninetales, which is absolutely trending upwards. Same with Paldea Evolved, where you got something like Magikarp, who has just been trending upwards from its 60-ish price tag. $75 in April, but before that it was around $60 and even at 50 at times. And now it's sitting at a market price of about 150 I think there's a couple different com uh, combining factors here. First and foremost, Paldea Evolved is becoming harder to find. Less of it is being ripped. Booster boxes are now sitting 120 plus per booster box. You're also having Paldea Evolved, um, seeing a lot of cards spike up, and we'll talk about a few others as well. And you have an artist named Shinji Kondo, which if we click Shinji Kondo's name, does a lot of very popular artworks. Now, give or take, you don't see price increases for commons, but that's because they're bulk. But the two high-end rarity cards that Shinji Kanda has done have both been very, very expensive. And then you have cards like the Galarian Moltres promo, the Moltres promo from, uh, I believe, why, why am I asking? Brilliant Stars. I was going to guess Brilliant Stars, but there's a logo. And then you have stuff like Aerodactyl. So if you're a Shinji Kanda collector, he's got two high-end cards to add to the binder, with all of these beautiful artworks, all of these amazing looking cards. And he doesn't have a large repertoire of cards. So if you were collecting your favorite artist, Shinji Kanda is a pretty easy artist to collect. And I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of people uh, see these two increase in price. It's because it is done by an artist that's very desired by a lot of collectors. A lot of people love the Shinji Kanda artwork. Now, I'm not a huge fan of it. Like I said, once again, going back to the Ninetales and Sai Nanahara, there's not a lot of busyness surrounding the Pokemon. If you look at both Giratina and Magikarp, it is crazy. Now, there is a lot of amazing details, such as the Gyarados at the top of the artwork, which makes it really stunning to observe. A lot of like little hidden details, a lot of nice niche details that you can find in the artwork. But it is super busy for my ADHD brain. So uh, uh, not for me although they are on my list to eventually add to the collection. Uh, but I can see the desire and I can see the appreciation for these artworks, especially for a uh, Pokemon just as popular as Magikarp. Another card I've seen a trend upwards um, is your um, uh, Raichu. Why can't I think of his name? About a $40 market price. Was sub $20 months ago. Slowly trickled up to being about $20 to $25 and then just spiked up. Raichu is a very popular Pokemon, the evolution of Pikachu, featured heavily in the OG anime as Lieutenant Surge's ace Pokemon. So a lot of people are going to love this card, and I gotta agree. Heracross, another very popular Pokemon, saw a spike to about $13 market price from your $7 to $8, so about 175% increase. Sprigatito. Another one that has trended upwards, not a heavy trend upwards because Sprigatito is about 10 and now it's sitting at about 12 to 13. 
Not a huge, huge jump, but it is a slight climb up. And I think this is a couple of factors. First and foremost, Brigatito just being probably one of the most popular starters in the last like three gens. A lot of people love Sprigatito. Pseudo Wudo one, I never expected to climb up. If I had written off any of the illustration writers we're talking about today, Pseudo Wudo would be the one I've written off. Um, sitting at almost double its price, a hundred percent increase. Uh, sitting at a market price of about thirteen to fourteen dollars. Chi Yu was another one that was attempted to be pumped and dumped. It was at a, like a sixteen dollar price tag. Went up to thirty to forty, and for like a day, it was at sixty. And I remember Opossum Bud reported on this. And if you want to go see uh, my comment on that video, you're more than welcome to. A lot of people were unhappy with it when I said that uh, that uh, Akira Gaw was my favorite artist. And I hated that uh, Pump and Dumpers and Buyout uh, participants were just trying to use Akira Gawa's name as a way to justify them buying out this card. Because look what's happened to this card. It's just trended downward since that initial spike. It's not like Magikarp. Or Raichu where they're holding strong. It's already gone down. This was a $60 card, which you can start getting now if you want to buy a light play copy at $25. It's 30 less than $30 for a near mint. And it's only going to trend downwards because this card did not have that artificial hype that a lot of other cards did. And it's just because everybody tried to use the artwork as a justification, but there are more factors than just artwork and how a card holds a price. Look at Shinji Kanda's Magic Art. What else does Shinji's Kanda Magikarp have that Chiyu doesn't? They're both fish, right? But one is a very, very unknown Pokemon. Unless you played this card in Violet Games, you don't really know Chiyu. But everybody knows Magikarp. Magikarp has had multiple chase cards in the past. Including a very famous Shining Magikarp. On the other hand, Chiyu, not as popular. Nowhere near as popular. Beautiful card, Done by my favorite artist in the TCG, but Chiyu does not have that popularity, nor as beautiful as an artwork as some of the other cards. So this one was not going to hold that price. But I am going to hit the fact home on why this is still beneficial to a lot of buyout people, a lot of the people participating in this buyout. Ralts has seen a trend upwards. It's gone from about a $10 card to about a $15 to $16 card, lowest on the market for a near mint. It's going to be around $15 for the non-feedback uh, sellers. High feedback sellers, about $16.50 for your lowest near mint copy. Curly has also trended slightly upwards from its initial like $8 to $9. And it is holding a price of about $10. Curly is not as popular as Ralt, in my opinion. So it's probably why it's not holding as an extreme of a jump as Ralt is. But it is still slowly trickling up as well. Slowpoke is another Gen 1 -er that has kind of climbed up a little bit. It went from about being a $7 to $6 card to about an $8 card. Not a huge increase, but it has shown a trend of Slowpoke slowly increasing. Pachirisu, on the other hand, trended downward since. Pachirisu is another card that I think personally has a great artwork. I've always liked the electric rodents rubbing cheeks and uh, sparking that electricity. If you kind of notice, the electricity kind of makes a shape of a heart showing a very, very wholesome moment between two Pokemon, but about a $3 price, right? Not holding strong, definitely a fallout from that high price point of a $5 card, and has only trickled downwards in recent uh, weeks. And there's uh, many reasons for that. Same with Toad School, right? Toad School has trickled downwards quite drastically uh, in recent weeks. This is done by Akira Komayama, who is a very, very well-known artist, Probably not a popular artist because it's one of my favorite artists, but it's because this artist does a very simplistic artwork. Their artwork is never complex. Their artwork is never heavily detailed. Very simplistic, but the use of bright, bold colors and the use of uh, like dark like outlines really helps this uh, artwork stick out to me. And I've always liked this Toad School card, but highest price point, only $3. And it's been under $3 for a few weeks now. And you can find many copies sitting below $3. So that brings me to the point. Why are certain cards in Scarlet and Violet, like Chansey, being targeted for price jumps or market manipulation in terms of buyouts? And I'm not saying every, every single card today has been a victim of a buyout. Some of these are just naturally climbing. 
and some of these were victims of buyouts. But why are certain Pokemon targeted? Why are certain cards targeted and not others? Why are certain IRs like Ghastly here targeted, but then Toad School or Pachirisu is not targeted? There are three factors. First and foremost, the artist on the card. Going back to Magic Art. Had that not been Shinji Kanda's name, this card might be slightly lower, right? Because I think a lot of people associate Shinji Kanda, especially when it's a high rarity card, with a good price tag. And I think that's thanks to Giratina Alt. But Raichu, for example, not a lot of people know who this artist is. So that brings me to probably the bigger factor, the Pokemon itself. I think the Pokemon itself plays a big role in what cards get bought out. Because think about it, right? Every card that we talked about today that is trending upwards or holding strong at a high point, every single one is a popular Pokemon, a fan favorite. We talked about Chi Yu, who, as much as I love Chi Yu, I've never heard anybody say Chi Yu is their favorite Pokemon. We talked about Pachi Risu, and as much as I love Pachi Risu, never heard anybody say Pachi Risu is my favorite Pokemon. I've I've never even seen a post about Toad School. I've never seen a post on the uh, Pokemon community Twitter or Pokemon community Instagram talking about the love for Toad School. Even if, not, not even saying they're your favorite, just nobody talking about Toad School. But I have seen a ton of people mention Slowpoke being one of their favorite. Ton of people loving the Ralts and Elk Gardevoir lineup. A ton of people loving Sprigatito. A ton of people loving Ninetales. Ton of people loving Evoltal, Steelix, especially Groudon. Gen 3 love is strong in the Pokemon community. And that brings me to the factor of certain cards. Like, maybe somebody will say, hey, Pseudo Wudo is not that popular. Pseudo Wudo is not a very popular Pokemon. That brings me to the third thing. I don't know if you noticed, but about half of the cards are Gen 3 and before. So, nostalgia also plays a big factor in which cards are targeted. So you got nostalgia, you got artwork, and then you got a uh, fan favorite Pokemon. So if it's not a fan favorite, if it's not a Pokemon that's going to be very popular like Pseudo Wudo compared to Raichu or Magikarp, it may be because it's a Gen 2 Pokemon. And a lot of people are very familiar and have a lot of nostalgia for Gen 2, especially Gold and Silver and Heart Gold and Soul Silver. So a lot of people have a lot of nostalgia for these games. Same with Heracross. A lot of people have nostalgia with Heracross as well. That's also the same with Groudon, right? A lot of people have nostalgia with Gen 3. And I think that helps influence the price increase on Groudon. So now the big question comes to why Scarlet and Violet? Why not stick with Sword and Shield, which is less on, available on the market? Why not continue pricing up Sword and Shield alts and Sword and Shield Ultra Rares? And that brings me to the idea that every card has a ceiling. I think a lot of people, a lot of investor bros might not admit this, but every card has a ceiling. I think we see those ceilings hit for a lot of those cards, especially a lot of those vintage cards, where they hit their highest price points during the pandemic, and they have not reached that price since. And I think a lot of cards, especially modern cards, which are still readily available, have a ceiling and the thing is is i think a lot of the cards that were pumped up during sun and moon and uh, sword and shield era uh, sets i think a lot of those are getting close to that ceiling that they're not moving as much with the markup prices or the uh pumped up prices so what can be your next target as somebody who participates in these uh tactics who's uh, somebody who buy, uh, joins into a, like a buyout group and targets a specific card what what would you target next, right? How about a card sitting at $16 that you can bump up to $34? Go through, buy every listing with your group, and then relist them once they arrive. Now you're making double profits because there's none available on market, right? Same with Groudon. Buy out at $20, $30 a copy, list at $60, double it. Then guess what happens? It takes a while for it to ever recover to this point if it doesn't. And there's probably a good chance with the idea of FOMOing over a card that has seen an increase, a lot of people will buy those high prices. 
Now, Danny Phantom said in his video, being patient and not FOMOing is key to not paying these ridiculous up price prices. But a lot of people do uh, pay them. A lot of people will pay them. A lot of people will pay them in the anticipation of a card going up. And that's why these cards have a ceiling. It's eventually you get to the point where the only potential buyers you have are those that are predicting the card to go up even more. And there are less people in the hobby doing that than there are average collectors. Your average collector wanting to complete their Paradox Rift set still needs Groudon. But if you put Groudon at $300, you're probably not going to have many of your average collectors buying it anytime soon. And next thing you know, you're only going to have the people buying it that predict Groudon is going to go up to $400 the next week. But there's no legitimate sales, no actual community to buy these cards once you pass up that ceiling. Hence the idea of a ceiling. In order to get a customer to pick up this card quickly and make a quick profit, a quick flip on it, you have to have a reasonable price tag that will still get people spending on it, spending those prices on it. Look at Groudon, for example. You still got quite a bit of sales in that 50 to 60 dollar price range with a couple here that dropped down to like 47 46 but you see here ignoring like all these foreign copies it is held strong and has sold consistently over the past few days at that price tag and even then only five days ago from recording 55 dollars 40 dollars but it has held strong and it has had consistent sales but you also see that a lot of people have turned to buying the foreign copies on TCG Player because now they're priced out at $60. And if you were to go higher than that, then you start pricing out some of these people that are willing to pay that $50, $60 price range, right? But at the same time, what is the potential loss here for a buyout uh, participant, right? Let's say you were buying out a Veltal at $7 a copy, right? And now it's $16. Let's say it goes back down to $7 and then you have to sell it at 7 just to recoup some of your money. How much money as a seller did you lose taking that risk? You lose like a dollar per card. You buy 30 cards, you lose $30 if all of them don't sell at 16. But let's say five of them sell at the 16 and you bought them all at 6. If five of them sell at the 16, you've already you're already in the green. You're already profiting. And that's why a lot of these lower end cards of popular Pokemon that are a higher rarity, such as Illustration Rare, such as Special Illustration Rare, are seeing a trend upwards. is because it's low risk, high reward for a lot of these people who join these buyout groups. But once again, there is a ceiling. If you pass up that ceiling, you will not uh, have anybody buying that card. You will not have anybody actively being able to purchase that card at a consistent basis like we see here with the $60 price tag or the $20 price tag for Eveltal. If this card was $80 for Eveltal, you're probably gonna, not going to have a lot of people spending that price on it. So there is a ceiling to where these cards can go. And I think that's what makes this very interesting is you have this ceiling where a lot of these cards can go and it kind of limits these cards. It kind of limits these cards to how fast they can grow but there is still potential for growth where these cards can see a massive increase. And it's crazy because you see a lot of cards that are of higher rarity that try to get these increases and don't hold them or can't increase at all because they're just not a very popular Pokemon. Like the increase here is very non-existent because if you were to buy this card at 1167 and list it at 13, you're not profiting after TCG player fees and shipping, right? There is no profiting here on a card at $13 jump from $11. But if you bought Magikarp at your $70, $60 price tag, or even if you bought it at $100, now that's at $150, it is a massive pump, a massive price increase. So I just kind of wanted to talk about why this stuff happens and why it keeps happening. Because it's very profitable for these groups, these people who participate in these buyout groups, because they they kind of I I assume they kind of break it down to a science and determine what price they can put these cards at where the card still sells. Because once you pass up that ceiling, once you hit that price where not many people can buy it at that price, you're not gonna get a lot of potential buyers for that card. You're not gonna have a lot of people out there breaking down the door to try to buy that card. 
So that is it for today's video, guys. I just kind of wanted to talk about this issue a lot, uh, kind of break it down on why people should not, or why buyouts take place, and why people should patiently wait to see if the card trickles down. Because a lot of these buyout prices don't hold strong, but as you can see with a lot of the trends, a lot of those prices don't ever go back to the lowest of the low. And it usually benefits those participating in buyouts because the card will always be a little bit higher than what it is when they bought it out at the low, low price. Now, once again, not all of these cards are victims of buyouts, uh, but some of them have been. And that is what has driven them up. Anyways, guys, stay tuned uh, this week for some other videos, including that video about why you don't buy foreign cards from TCG Player. Have a great day, guys. Bye.